Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. Well, greetings, everyone. Welcome to Hotline Ministry. Last week, we asked you a question, do you really want to be made whole? We're going to continue that thought this week. Well, once again, everyone, greetings and welcome to Hotline Ministry. I'm Pastor Harold Noyce, pastor of the Community Christian Church. We're located in Athens, Vermont. Next to me is my co-host, Pastor Timothy Golden. He is pastor of Life on Main in Charlestown, New Hampshire. And we call it Hotline Ministry because we, we take the Word of God and try to apply it to our hearts because we know that, that God is interested most in the heart of man, mm -hmm. you know, uh, God is not one who really is terribly concerned about the facade or the outside or the covering or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to see that today a little bit with the religious Pharisees of Jesus' day besides, right? Because right. they, you know, now they're all bent out of shape because Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And they were not only angry with Jesus for that, but they were angry with the man who was healed on the Sabbath mm -hmm. because he took up his bed and walked. And, yeah. and you know, so many of us, uh, we allow the, the non-essentials to become an essential. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, you know, that's what I'm reading in this, Tim. Absolutely. And it's much like we mentioned last week that what they did is they took one of God's commandments and in a right manner, it's good to, to try to figure out what certain things mean. It, the one commandment is where it says, remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. Yep. Now, the problem is, is they, they then created a bunch of other sub-laws of how it is that they felt you needed to live your life to keep the day holy. And so they began to make many different um, assumptions, like how far you could walk, the sorts of things you could do or not do on the Sabbath because they felt that if you, d if and again, they felt right. that if you did these things, that, that meant you were not keeping it holy, which is why Jesus kept trying to bring them back to hold it. Which of you, you know, he mentions one place about, you know, how you got upset because I healed on the Sabbath. Talked about, um, actually we'll be talking about that a little bit later on. And how, you know, if you find it's okay to circumcise, but you know what, I did for a man brought a whole lot more healing into his life than simply going through the act of circumcision, and you're against me for this. And it's like, so he's trying to help them understand, look, you, you, you've put a lot of your own stipulations upon the law that the Father never placed there, and so you cannot hold men to those things. Yeah, and you know, and, and I find this, whether it be in the religious realm of how, you know, we, we have many of us, and, and I think all of us probably at a point, have these these little bits and pieces of us that we want to keep as holy, mm -hmm. even though it may not be taught for everybody. Right. But because it's for us, we try to imply it for everybody. Mm -hmm. The Pharisees in Jesus' day were much, and, and excuse the expression or the comparison, but I, I look at the Pharisees of yesterday or yesteryear in Jesus' life, much like the politicians of today. Mm. Because the politicians of today, what are they, all, what are they so in, in, intrinsically set to do? Oh, we've got to make another law, got to make another law, got to make another law. The trouble is, is they're not keeping the laws in which they made. Right. You know, and, but it's always in, well, let's, if we write another law, that will cure all. And that's not really 
where it's at. Right. And the Pharisees were doing the very same thing. Mm-hmm. God had given us his law, yeah. but then man started adding, what, 200 or mm-hmm. 2,000 laws besides, whatever, whatever the number is, right. you know, to, to try to, well, God meant this, or I think God mm-hmm. meant this, when in fact all God said was you got to keep the Sabbath day holy. Right. And this is a lot of another reason why Jesus had to come and where the transformed power comes. It's, yes, it's through salvation, but it was to address some of those attitudes because you cannot legislate righteousness, yep. no matter how hard you try. And the Old Testament gives us a picture of that. You know, why was the Old Testament law given? To show us, really, in a sense, you can't do this on your own. This is beyond you. And so, and it's not to say there's not a place for righteousness or there's not a place for some of those things. But what Jesus wanted to help them understand and why he said that when he was asked, like, what's the greatest commandment? They wanted him to pick, which is the greatest legislation, righteous yeah. legislation yep. that we've, we've developed. And he said, I'll tell you what the greatest one is, is that you love the Lord your God, that you love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, now on that hinges everything else. Every, all these other laws that you're trying to focus so much on, if you get back to the importance of the relationship with the Father, number one, and your relationship with one another, and you let that be your governing force, then you know what? All the laws will fall into place. And you won't need to be worried so much about the thou shalt not kill and the thou shalt not steal, because if you love your brother, you won't do those things. Right, right. And, and so it was bringing them to this reality. <clears throat> Stop just legislating things. Understand you want to get righteous. It uh, only comes through a relationship with the Father, and then you'll be able to do it. You know, not to say that this is wrong, because I think sometimes we, it's nice to go back in history mm-hmm. a little bit, because I remember Pastor Hanson, the fellow that um, was pastoring when I came to Athens, and because uh, he was born in 1900, mm-hmm. and he was telling me as a child, for example, when Sunday came, they put on their Sunday best, they would go to church, they would come home, and they had to stay inside. Mm-hmm. And of course, no stores were open. Nothing was done. The mother had mm-hmm. to do the cooking all all day Saturday for Sunday, and and all of these things because they wanted to try to maintain to keep the Sabbath holy. And I, I think certainly we may have gone overboard in in eliminating that because you go to church and then you go to a football game, you go do this, you go do all kinds of things, and mm-hmm. and kind of forget what the Sabbath day is. And these people were on the other side where. You know, for that whole day, all they did was sleep, maybe play some board games, I, you know, or something, you know, but they just spent that day in the house, and that was it. Mm-hmm. And, of course, you know, coming to mid-50s and so forth, or whatever, um, 40s even, they started opening up some of the stores and the blue laws and things mm-hmm. of that nature. But, you know, so man, man tends to sometimes go overboard on a lot of things, mm-hmm. and and I was seeing the Pharisees do that. Right. You know, they they, you know, they said, well, we want to make sure that we cover everything, so they make it so broad mm-hmm. that you know you can't even sneeze on the you know on the Sabbath day or something. It's mm-hmm. against the law. So this is what you know what now they're facing after Jesus healed this right. this uh, lame man, right? So mm-hmm. so that is what's happening. So we're in John chapter 5. We're going to be covering verses 10 through 18, 19. Maybe, maybe depending on how things go, we may go a little further. But, you know, but it's, that's pretty much what we're going to cover today is the Pharisees and Jesus' response to them and their response to Jesus and so forth. So it's kind of the conversation. And, and actually, Tim, as I'm reading this, I, I like this because I want to make sure that I want to wish everybody... Of course, this Sunday is Palm Sunday, and mm-hmm. then you got Easter coming up. you got the Passion Week yep. um, coming up. And certainly want to wish everybody a, a real a wonderful, holy Passion Week of, of remembering what Christ did for us and in his life for us and so forth. And all of this, in my view, is covered in this because they're questioning, Jesus, who are you? And Jesus is saying, I and my Father basically are one. I mean, I'm equal with him, and that's what really get yeah. them all bent out of shape. Well, certainly all of this has to do with what happened Passion Week and mm-hmm. and all of that. So, But I want to wish everybody, or Tim and I want to wish everybody a, a real a wonderful Passion Week and truly that your hearts and our, my heart, our hearts would all become just gelled with Christ and, and uh, more and more in love with Him 
uh, as we think of what he has done for us uh, this, this wonderful week. I'm going to open in prayer, and then Tim's going to read verses 10 through 18 or so, and then we're going to discuss that. Father, we thank you so very much that you have given us your wonderful word. Mm -hmm. And Father, we ask now that as Tim and I read it and look at it and just try to expound upon it, Father, that we would not do it in ourselves, but that your Holy Spirit would give both Tim and myself and the listener and the, and the person watching um, the insight needed, Father God, to draw us ever closer to yourself. Mm -hmm. So, Lord, use this time. Bless it. May you be glorified in all things. In the precious name of Christ, amen. Amen. So starting at verse 10. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured... It is the Sabbath, it is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews saw all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Wow, what a wonderful portion. One thing, Tim, that, that kind of makes the New Testament different from the Old Testament is the Old Testament Jew never called God Father. Right. I mean, they could not have that intimate relationship. Right. Matter of fact... Um, they wouldn't even speak the name Jehovah or, mm -hmm. you know, because it was so holy and, and, and such that they were afraid to say it or Adonai or some of the names. Right. And even when it came to writing it out, they wouldn't write out the full name. They right. would write out only specific letters because it was too holy to too put holy on paper. Too holy to mention. So now you get into this where Jesus is now on the scene and all of a sudden, you know, he's not calling him Jehovah God. He's not some of those things. He's calling him my father. Mm -hmm. And so contrary to especially who the Pharisees were, mm -hmm. thinking that they were keeping all this stuff holy and keeping all this stuff just just so for God. Mm -hmm. But that goes to tell us or show us that we in our own effort, we can't do that. Right. You know, the, and I'm finding, at least in my own life, the more and more I try, it seems like the more and more I mess up mm. because I'm not allowing God to do the work in which he needs to do. Right. Now, I need to have the want to and, and things of that nature, but sometimes when I try to fix things, it becomes a bigger mess than, mm -hmm. than before, you know. And, and I think we're finding this with the Pharisees. Yeah. So let's go down. Now, now, Jesus just healed a man who had been by the pool, the stirring of the pool, and one would go in and get healed, and, and he never had anybody there to help him get into that mm -hmm. pool. Now, Jesus doesn't use the pool. All he does is look at the man and say, do you want to be? Mm -hmm. And the man, man said, yes. Yep. And a man whom he knew had already been there a long time. 38 years? Yeah. And, and so I figured, you know, I, I wonder if this goes back even to when he was, when we read about him being in the temple when he was a, a young boy at 12 mm -hmm. years of age. He may have seen this man by that pool, mm -hmm. even at that point in his life. And now here it is many years later. And he's still there, you yep. know, for we don't. I, and I can only imagine that's probably what it had to deal with, because he did go frequently to the temple all through his growing up years. That was what a good Jew did. And so he would have seen him over and over and over and over again. And but waited until this day to heal him. Yeah. You know, I'm wondering and, and I think you have a great point there. And I, I'll be honest with you. I never even have thought of that, that, you know, being in a young, impressionable lad. Mm -hmm going into the temple and seeing these people hanging out there trying to get healed or trying to be made whole and who knows i mean maybe this maybe he and jesus had some problems. i have no idea right. and i don't want to play into that too mm -hmm. much but but still you know that that is a, a a part that i never really had even given any thought to mm -hmm. that as as a lad going into the temple and seeing all those people around the pool and probably asking joseph or mary why are they here uh-huh what's what's all this and Oh, come along, son. We don't want to 
you know, whatever. And, right. You know, so made must have made some sort of an impression on him. But anyway, Jesus now comes back, and he's starting his ministry, um, and comes back to do some work in mm -hmm. ministry that he's now going to do. So the Jews said to him that was cured, it is the Sabbath day, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. And, and you know, there is a form of work, I guess, in carrying your bed that they just thought that it would desecrate the holy day or the Sabbath day. And, and once again, this is all man-made law. This is not God-made law mm -hmm. that they just keep adding to and adding to and adding to, mm -hmm. and thinking that they're getting it right, I guess. But right. But as we said, too, I mean, these are laws that had been developed over hundreds of years. Uh, that uh, I would imagine a lot of these laws probably came about even during that time of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament mm -hmm. when there was no prophets, when, when there was no prophetic word coming forth, where they then began to establish maybe some of these things and probably established some of them even before then as well. But um, so you're talking, th these were not laws they just made up a, a couple years ago. They, you know, they, they, many generations before them mm -hmm. had been taught this and now have passed it down. And so in their own minds, may have found themselves equating it to Scripture just because they had heard it preached right alongside the Scriptures. And just like I know I, I've had happen, you know, at times in my life where I'll hear things come out of people's mouths, it's like, okay, or, or things even coming out of my own. It's like, okay, now what's the biblical basis for what I just said? Yep. And Last time I'll go and I'll find it. But you know what? There have been some occasions where I've gone back. It's like, you know what? Really, there's no biblical basis for what I just said. And and I've had to rethink those things and begin yep. to realize how much of that was just my religious tradition mm -hmm. that I had been taught. Yep. And so that was undoubtedly going on here as well. You know, I think in verse 11, it goes and shows us what kind of authority Jesus had. Mm -hmm. Obviously, as I look at it anyway, in verse 11, Jesus must have spoken to this man with great authority mm -hmm. because they asked him, or, or he answered the Pharisees in verse 11, he that made me whole, the same said unto me, take up thy bed and walk. So, you know, he, he knows what the law is mm -hmm. and he knows what the rules and regulations are, if you will. But when Jesus came and asked him, do you want to be made whole? Yes, I do. All right, take up your bed and walk. Yeah. immediately. And that's exactly what he did. Mm -hmm. There had to have been a great authority in his voice or, mm -hmm. or how he said it or something mm -hmm. that would make this man forget or leave what mm -hmm. he knew to be tradition and automatically do that. Yeah. And then you couple this in the eyes of Pharisees who considered themselves to be the holier than thou's. We've got this down. It's up to us to make sure you do too. And you couple that with the with the cultural mindset of the day that if you had any kind of physical ailment, and there is some validity to this, by the way, yep. uh, even in, in our day and culture, I'm not saying every situation, but they believe that in every situation where there was a physical ailment, it was because either you sinned or your parents sinned. Right. So not only are you not a Pharisee, but the fact that you were crippled you obviously are really n far removed from being a Pharisee. And so you're not one who's lived a pure life. And now we see you again doing something unpure, mm -hmm. just like you, because yeah. I don't expect anything different from you because you are a pagan. You, you are obviously a, a man full of sin because you would not have been stricken ill to begin with. And now you've been healed, and now here you are again sinning on, on the Sabbath day. Yeah. In their minds. Right, and I think you're making reference especially to when Jesus healed the blind man. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, in the healing of the blind man, you know, they, they, they asked him, who did this? And, and is it, or asked even Jesus, I think, is it, is it his sin or is it his parents' sin that, that caused this man to be blind? And Jesus answered, none of them. Right. It's for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. You know, so... 
you know, certainly we go through things that doesn't necessarily have to be because of our own personal sins. Right. It's just because God wants to be glorified mm-hmm. in in us getting over this hurdle or moving this mountain that that mm-hmm. he now has us climbing at this point in time. And, right. you know, so it, it does not necessarily have to be a sin that we did or mm-hmm. uh, we do know that it all came because of sin, but that would be the original sin back in the garden right. and, and all of that. So... So he goes and, and, and he just speaks outwardly to them, to the Pharisees, saying, look, he said, take up your bed and walk. So that's what I did. Mm-hmm. I just, I followed what he said. And mm-hmm. guess what? I'm whole. Yeah. I can walk and I can carry my bed and I don't have to lay at the pool anymore. Um, maybe I've gotten off the social system of the, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. You know, yeah. it's just... You know, this is a good thing. Yeah. But the Pharisees refused to see it as that. Right. And it's remembering, too, that because of his condition, he was considered unclean. He did not have access to the temple. He did not have access to the teachings because of that uh, to be able to have the same level of upbringing as most other Jewish boys had in that day and age where they are tar- taught from the minute they're able to walk, right? The, the very scriptures and asked to actually and required to memorize scriptures. He didn't have that. His role was this, go and simply sit at this pool, sit and beg alms. And so he didn't have maybe a lot of the knowledge. And that may have been another thing that the Pharisees were addressing is, look, this is wrong. And so when he makes this comment that, well, he told me to take out my bed and walk, it's not necessarily him finding fault. He may not have been aware of that specific law that they had passed. So it's like, why shouldn't I? I was told to pick it up, so I did. And of course, you look at them, and especially, you know, these people who are sitting by the pool and so forth, they were social outcasts. Right. So maybe he didn't have the knowledge because of being a social... I mean, he didn't have a whole lot of interaction with the Pharisees. Right. You know, the Pharisees certainly don't want to be within 20 feet of him, you know, mm-hmm. because they might become unclean or whatever. And and now for them to come and approach him, I mean, that must have really threw him for a loop, saying, wow, these religious people now are coming to me and approaching me, when before they would make a wide circle to get away from me? How come? What's right. up? Why is this? Mm-hmm. You know, so, I mean, I'm not sure he fully understood or mm-hmm. was able to comprehend all that had happened, but he right. was made whole. Yeah, because, again, it wasn't a matter of he, he's only been <laughs> ignored for a year or two. This yeah. has been his entire life. Right. That's very out of character. So, yeah. you know, so that's really interesting. You know, now getting into the next section here, when they asked him who it was and he did not know, he said that he who healed was not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, um, a multitude being in that place. So Jesus did not go and say to him, Hi, I'm Jesus, I'm the Son of God, take up your bed and walk. He didn't even introduce himself, he didn't do anything. Right. All he said is, do you want to be made whole? Yes, I do. Take up your bed and walk. And then Jesus walks away. Yeah. You know, so it isn't like he made a big production out of this. It wasn't right. any of this stuff. He just, in normal conversation, mm-hmm. do you want to be? Yes, I do. Then get up and walk. Yeah. And then he, you know, he gets lost in the crowd, so to speak. Mm-hmm. You know, so that the guy doesn't even really know who he is. Who doesn't know really until he gets back into the, goes into the temple. Right. To see who it is, which I really find, you know, very interesting uh-huh. that, he would not know at this point. But this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Mm-hmm. So this is only, what, the third miracle that we, we right. I think we see in this portion of Scripture. So, you know, it isn't as if Jesus had been doing a whole bunch of miracles before and in all this. So this is this is all pretty much new to them. But he did not know who it was because in verse 13, he that was healed was not did not know who it was for Jesus had gone away and a multitude was in that place. Afterwards, now there's a little time. Mm-hmm. I personally think it's probably the same day, maybe a couple of hours, whatever. But afterwards, Jesus finds him in the temple. So, does Jesus go look for him now in the temple, mm. and so that he can finish the conversation, mm. and you know, and do that? I don't yeah. know, but I, I'm inclined to think that's probably the case because of the one word there, and, um, and I'm looking at the New King James. It says yep. afterward, Jesus found him. Yep. 
So that implies to me that there was some sort of a seeking. It wasn't that he ran into him. It's not, oh, he happened to just see him yep. since he found him. And, and that, would, that would imply that there was a searching out for. So, and as we look at verse 14, I think there's a reason for this. When did salvation come to this man? Salvation, in my view at least, in verse 14, does not come before verse 14. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was physically made whole. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was physically made now so that he could walk and do the things that he wanted to do. But there's still a, a further business that Jesus needed to conduct with this man. Mm -hmm. And we find that now in verse 14. Right. right. I've started the process, but I haven't finished it yet. Yep. So he went to seek out this man to finish the process, to, to finish what it was that he needed to do to make this man mm -hmm. whole. This man, from verses 10 to 13, in my view, is not fully made whole yet mm -hmm. until verse 14. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is because Jesus finds him in the temple and says to him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest the wrong thing come, unto, or worse thing, excuse me, come unto you. Mm -hmm. So he goes, and now he completes the task. Yeah. Right? So mm -hmm. do you see in verse 14 that this is probably the salvation experience here? Absolutely. Um, and for, for a couple of reasons, now, number one, to come back to the first thing that we had mentioned. So we're seeing here being identified that the reason for his specific physical ailment was sin. Yep. That it was a sin issue in his life that had brought this upon him because it says, okay, you've been set free now, sin no more unless something worse comes upon you. So it would almost imply here that his specific ailment was related to some sin, either in his life or whoever's, right, or his or her parents. Um, but as you said, what, and I think this point for us to understand, so what is salvation? Well, we know that salvation is more than just simply understanding that Jesus died for your sins. Because even the demons know that Jesus died for sins. Right. But that doesn't save them, right? And because they can't get saved. <laughs> What brings about salvation is understanding that he did that, accepting that over your life because he came to die for mankind, not for the fallen angels, and to repent, right? To, to now seek to no longer live according to our old way, but now live according to his. Because scripture throughout the New Testament, through the words of Christ, through the words of the Apostle Paul, you see over and over and over again this aspect of that you are now delivered from sin, but now the fruit will follow. Now there will be this aspect of a choice to no longer keep living in sin. Not that we won't still sin, but we don't, we're not driven to do that. Yeah. And we find our lives becoming less filled with sin. Not that we ultimately become sinless. <laughs> right. So I think you and I really are... Uh in very much agreement here where when a person truly comes to know Christ as their personal savior, truly is born again or truly is saved, mm -hmm. that there's going to be a transformation in their life. And that's what we have mm -hmm. here, the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Yep. If there is no transformation or no change done, then I caution my people, man, if there's no change, no change in your life, it doesn't, I'm not saying this big dramatic thing or whatever, mm -hmm. like in this guy's case, this is a pretty dramatic change, right. going from never being able to walk or even stand on his legs, and now he can dance if he wants to, mm -hmm. you know, pretty traumatic change. Not everybody has that, but everybody does have a change. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's saying to this man, right? There's going to be a change in your life. Mm -hmm. Not only that you could now walk physically, mm -hmm. but there's going to be a change of attitude. There's going to be mm -hmm. a change of mindset. There's going to be a change of the way you, you see things and think of things. Yeah. And I think of, uh, was it Second Corinthians 5.17? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Right. You know, um, old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Yeah, and and, but, and then coupled with that, you have the other teachings, uh, like where you see it mentioned, work out your salvation. Yeah, with fear and trembling, and and so it's th there's an aspect where there's the there's that tra there's that immediate transformation. You know, the old to the new, right? The, the old the old man is dead. The new has now come. 
but yet the, there's this aspect of the journey. There's this aspect of the process, this working out. And so, there, like I said, there's something dramatic that happens. Now, it might not be dramatic emotionally. It might not be dramatic physically. But there's something you know takes place in your heart. Not that you get perfect immediately. Right. You know, once you get saved, there's still a lot of world in you. And God now begins that process of weeding those things out. And it's a daily attitude of repentance that has to be in our lives each and every moment of every day as long as we're on this planet. Yep. I've been walking with them over 50 years as of you. And I'm sure, like myself, there's seldom a day that goes by that I don't find myself having to repent well, yeah. of something. Yep. You know, sometimes many things in a given right. day, right? So it's living that on a repeated basis. It's not, you know, I think of, of singing, for instance. You know, they said one, one thing that happens, like one bad way to sing is some people think that when you sing and if you've got a, a note that's like eight beats long, some people think you, you need to sing and hold the note. But one thing I learned in voice classes is this. There's no such thing as holding a note because if you try to hold the note, you will go flat. Yep. What you do is you hit the note and you keep re-singing the note over the course of those eight beats. So there's this, you're literally every second, you're re-singing that note. And that's sometimes where that vibrato comes in with some people. Because if you don't, you will go flat. And the same thing in our Christian life. I think some people think that, well, just because I get saved, I now just hold the note. I, I now just got to wait till Jesus comes. You know, if that's the attitude, you will go flat. Right. Yep. You've got to keep living each and every moment as though it's the first moment, you know, and, and being willing to live every moment in that same heart of repentance and then allowing God to do what he needs to do to keep that, keep everything fresh. You know, I think the uh, Hebrew writer says it well, and I think Paul also mentions this, is they use the word exercise. Mm -hmm. And you know you have to exercise yeah. you know to keep it fresh you have to exercise to keep it in the forefront mm -hmm. you know or it's going to get stale or it's going to get uh, not fresh and not going to be fresh anymore mm -hmm. and that's why i believe very much in in attending services of getting hooked up to a good bible believing church mm -hmm. and pastor and so forth because that's how we we learn to exercise what it is God has given to us, mm -hmm. you know, and and learning more and 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 understanding and having a closer relationship, you know. I find that you know, Patty and I've been married almost 51 years now, and I'm finding that in those 51 years, I've learned to love her more now than I ever did. Um, I feel closer to her now than I ever was while we were dating or even first married. Why? Because, you know, you, you, you learn to exercise. You learn to learn more about her. Mm -hmm. You learn to understand her better, and she understands you better. And, and it's, a, it's an exercise that you have to keep on doing. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing in our spiritual health. That's right. It has to be an exercise. And, and that's what Jesus is saying to this man. Look, I'm not going to just give you your legs back and and there's not going to be uh, any work on your side because it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's saying to him. Yeah. He says, look, uh, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing happen to you. Look, you know what caused your, your paralysis mm -hmm. in the first place. Now, just be assured of this, that if, if you go back to what you were doing, it's going to, make, it's going to become worse for you than what you have ever experienced. So I'm letting you know that. You know, it's going to have a bigger hold on you. It's going to have a, you know, a bigger part on you. And, mm -hmm. it, and I think that, that that happens to a lot of people. Yep. Um, you know, if they, and I'm just, I'm not picking on anybody, but, you know, those who have had trouble with drink, for example, they get saved, and then they go dry for a long period of time. But then what happens if they pick up one bottle? Mm-hmm. Or they take a cup of wine or juice or, or beer or whatever. It's almost like it, it grabs a hold of them worse than what they had before they had given mm -hmm. it up. You know, it just becomes a worse thing. Right. Something that, that, boy, it's almost unmanageable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what he's saying to this young man is, hey, um, you've got to be careful. You've got to keep exercising yourself because mm -hmm. if you don't, it's going to be worse than what you had before. Yeah. And I think that that is, you know, that's a good warning for us today mm -hmm. in our lives as Christians, you know, um, right. that it would become a big, bigger hold on us. So the man departed, verse 15, and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews 
persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Now that is a is certainly is a is a death sentence, isn't it? To do mm-hmm. something on the Sabbath day, and that's good good to take your life. In their opinion, it was. Yep. You know, doesn't make any sense to us. But you know what? Though when you've got when when you've given way to a, a level of piety that is not rooted in a relationship with God, that's the kind of mindset that'll take place. Yeah. You know, you begin to look at others uh, with eyes of greater judgment. And I think that's a lot of what you're seeing going on here. It wasn't just the, the, their, their interpretation of the law. It's the fact that their hearts were so far removed from the Father that if you're disobeying our law, then you don't deserve to live. Yep. And we're seeing that in our, even in our society amongst people that don't proclaim the name of Christ. Um, I, I think of uh, we recently this past week, there was some school shoot, a school shooting in Tennessee at a Christian school that had took place, where I believe six people were murdered. Yep, yep. And what was sad is some, and I'm not saying all, but there were some secular news groups that you actually heard this proclaimed, that, well, as, as Christians you should expect that because you don't like the, tra- the transgender people like this one individual was that did the shooting. And it was almost like they were justifying. Yep. The, the way it was said, it sounded almost like we can justify where she was at. You, yep. you brought it on yourself. But yet if the shoe was reversed, you know, and it had been somebody walking into a transgender school or, yep. you know, or some other, you know, a gay bar or something of that nature, and this was to take place, there would have been a totally opposite reaction from the world, yep. right? Be, and why? because of where the heart is, or should I say where the heart is not, and it's not rooted in God, and it's not rooted in His love and in His compassion for others. And when you're rooted in Him, it totally changes everything. The Pharisees were not rooted in Him. That's why Jesus said, you're like whitewashed tombstones. You look nice on the outside, but inside you're just dead. Yeah. Now, do you think already, now Jesus' ministry is just starting all right. This would be mm-hmm. the first year in his ministry, probably the first few weeks or first few months in his ministry, right, of the three-year ministry that he had. But do you see that the Pharisees now, they've looked at him, they've heard about his turning the water into wine. Mm-hmm. They've heard about him going and talking to this Pharisee, uh, this uh, Samaritan woman, and that the men came down and they all got saved. Um, they've heard that, and now they're seeing this, hey, this is a guy we got to watch out for. Mm-hmm. I mean, this guy is going to be trouble. Yeah, yeah, because there's been a lot of people over the last three, four hundred years since we heard the last prophetic word, a lot of people trying to step up to the plate and try to proclaim that they're the Messiah or that they're at least a prophet of sorts. Mm-hmm. And they've been off their rockers. And it's now our job to rid the world of these sorts yeah, of people. Yeah, let's protect them. Yep. You know, and but up until this point, people have been a lot of a lot of bark, no bite. Right, they they've been able, they've been talking a good talk, but when it came down to doing the things that Jesus is doing, those things were not happening because they did not hold the power to do so yep. from 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 the Father. So now you've got Jesus doing these things, but unlike the others, who maybe spoke the words first and then tried to do a couple things later, Jesus is doing it in quite the reverse. He's doing the stuff. Yep. And only now, in the midst of doing the stuff, does he begin now to get questioned. What's going on? What right do you have? And then that's when he lets it all hang out. You know, I, I'm thinking as you were talking there about how Jesus really turned the tables upside down. I can imagine that these, these false Christs or these false messiahs, whatever, you know, would go to this, for example, let's take this lame man, go to this lame man and say, I'm the Messiah, now rise up and walk. Mm-hmm. And he wouldn't be able to do it. Right. Right? Jesus didn't do that. Mm-hmm. Jesus just simply said, you want to be home? Yes. Get up and walk. And then he walks away. Yeah. Did not introduce himself, did not say I'm the Messiah, did not say I'm the Son of God, did not do any of those things at this up to this point. Mm-hmm. And he just turns around and walks away. Yeah. And like I said, with the other things, the, the, the whole situation at the wedding feast. Yep. 
It was not seeking to make a name for himself. In fact, he even told his mother, you know, yeah. I, you know, it's not my time yet. Look, do this. And so, and it, but again, it wasn't standing on the soapbox saying, okay, as the Messiah, I'm going to go ahead and do all this. No, he did it quietly, very subdued, covertly, and just did it. Yeah. And, you know, it's, yeah, it totally upset the apple cart. Um, in the way that things have happened until now, which is probably what caused them to be more inquisitive with Jesus yeah, I than think, with anybody else. And, and I think also, you know, you look at it and say, wait a minute, this guy, this guy's doing it underground, man. I mean, he's, you know, he's doing it behind their backs. He's doing it. He's not announcing all this stuff, proclaiming all this stuff. He's just simply doing it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and this guy's going to be trouble. Mm -hmm. This guy's going to be trouble because he's getting a following and he's getting a group yeah. of people now that are, that are following him. And if they're following him, who are they leaving? Right. They're leaving the Pharisees. They're leaving those, those religious mm -hmm. zealots. who, yeah. Which are much more than just, as you said before, or made the analogy to before, it's more than just religious leaders. That, along with being a religious leader in the culture, in this day, during this time, you carried a lot of political clout. You carried a lot of um, influence, uh, not only in the church, but on the worldwide stage. And so that was, you know, you start taking away their following. You know, think about our own politicians today. Mm -hmm. You take away anybody from their following, they get a little bit upset. Yeah. You know, and it was no difference here. Yeah. You know, now, verse 16 intrigues me, Tim, and maybe you can help me with this. It says, therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him. What is it that they've done? Is it simply because they're now questioning and they, they're, they're trying to refute what Jesus has done? Or how is it, do you think, that they, it says that they, therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus? And it, there's no, I don't see anything in here that shows what you and I would call a persecution today. Mm. Um, is it just simply because they're saying, stay away from this guy, this guy is trouble, or, or do you think that there's other ways in which they were persecuting? But John does not make mention of it, nor does do the other gospel writers. It just says that they right. persecuted him. I, you know, that just kind of gets me, my mind wandering, saying, what did they do mm -hmm. to him? Um, did they make it so that he would have to sleep under the stars and not mm -hmm. get a hotel room? I, I don't know, you know. Yeah. Well, I think that um, it's coupling it together with this aspect of, and they sought to kill him. Not that they were looking to kill him that very moment, right. but there was, they were putting things in They're place. putting a case, yeah. getting a case ready for him. Exactly. And I think along with that came, you know, undoubtedly some bad mouthing. Like, mm -hmm. don't follow this guy. He's off his rocker. Don't you remember all those other fake messiahs that we had? He's just like them, you know? And so there had been that lumping together, but... Uh, but because of the kind of power that they carried, they could have, and again, we don't see this specifically in Scripture, but just from what we know culturally speaking, and what does tend to, what we've seen throughout history in a lot of different avenues, that when you've got that kind of power, you tend to exercise it at every level you can. So were they making it difficult for merchants to deal with him? You know, look, you sell anything to him, you know, there's going to be trouble. We're watching you guys, you know. So were they applying some peer pressure um, with with the community as a mm -hmm. whole? Could very well yeah, have been. Yeah, could be, could be just that, you know, that invert, uh, covert um, persecution at this point, mm -hmm. you know, not out and out persecution as we would. Yeah, because we've seen many times throughout Scripture says, and they saw even more intently. Yeah. You know, and so they keep upping the ante as, as, as he continues in his ministry. So and then what, what really fascinates me now is that, you know, in verse 16, it says that they go and they, 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 they persecuted Jesus. They sought to slay him because he had done these things. So that made Jesus back off, not according to verse 17, <laughs> because in verse 17, what does Jesus go? He, he, he really ruffles their yeah. feathers further <laughs> yeah. by saying, my father worketh hitherto and I work. Mm -hmm. And certainly the Pharisees had no trouble at all knowing that Jesus was talking about God the Father, mm -hmm. was not talking about Joseph, right? you know, yeah. and, and things of that nature. So this is now going to put another uh, heated spike in their wounds mm -hmm. because he says, oh, by the way, 
I, just to let you know who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, I am the son of God. You know, he yeah. is my father. And mm -hmm. that really ruffled their feathers and got them very upset. Matter of fact, the question that I had, as you and I were, were talking about this earlier before we went on air, is can you, can people say, I know God without knowing the Son? Hmm. Can people say that I love God without loving the Son? I say no. Well, uh, well, well depending on how you're yeah. defining those terms. You know, if... The truth is, is what we often think of as knowing, we look at from a Western culture yeah. standpoint, and we think of knowing as being an intellectual thing. That's not what the word means when you see it, when you see it mentioned in Scripture. And, and that's what people are doing. They're saying, well, Scripture says about knowing God. Well, I know God. Well, n not if you're talking about that knowing, because that knowing is talking about having an intimacy intimate with relationship. Yep. And you cannot have an intimate relationship with the Father except through the Son. Right. Scripture makes that very clear. Jesus made that very clear. So for, you know, you might be using the same terminology but and things that you think are the same word, but they're not the same word. What we're saying is I know of God, not that I know Him. Right. Right. And so to, can you, I know Him intellectually? Yeah. Even without having relationship, yep. I can know of Him. Just like I could pick up a book and I can say, oh, now I know a bit about Hitler. Yeah. Well, I never knew Hitler, right? Or Mother Teresa, yep. same thing, right? I know of Mother Teresa. I don't know Mother Teresa, though I might say, oh, yeah, I know her, you know, because I'm familiar with the right. name. But no, I don't know her. Her family, no, you know, her, or, or those that were close to her knew her, right? And her family knew her, not me. Not me. And, and, and so... I, I think it's we got to look at it from that standpoint that yeah you can know but you you don't you can't know without Christ not a yeah. true knowing yeah to, to have a, a to really know what it is to have an intimate relationship with the Father you must also have an intimate relationship with the Son yeah let me read verse twenty three I want to go down here verse twenty three we'll get back up to seventeen and eighteen in just a moment but that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at that saying, wait a minute, you cannot really know the Father without knowing the Son. Mm -hmm. Right. You just can't. Well, even John had mentioned, right, that, um, you know, that passion just started going on in my head. Um, the, he, who said, he who loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves God, he that loveth not God, or he that loveth not knoweth not God. Right. For God is, is love. love. Right. And how is that love made manifest? As we also read Scripture, in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And, and so, we you can't separate God the Father from God the Son. They are intertwined, and to claim one without the other, you, you just can't. Do you, it. Ju you can't do it. Um, you know, so. And I, and I just want everybody to understand this, mm -hmm. that one of the reasons that I love, I love this week more than even Christmas. Because Christmas, you've got the beautiful story of the virgin having the baby and, and things of that nature and the miraculous birth and, and all that goes with that. But now you, you have him coming full circle and now he's going to die for me. Mm -hmm. And now he's going to give his life. He's going to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. Yep. And I'm laying down my life for you. I came because the Father sent me. That's mm -hmm. why I came. Yep. I and my Father are one. Mm -hmm. And you can't separate us. And, and you know, it, it kind of bothers me or whatever when people try to separate the Father from the Son because you really can't do it. Not if right. you really know them. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. And I think verse 23, which we'll get into next week, um, 19 through. Let's go to verse 18 because Colin is saying our time is coming up. In verse 18, therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him. So we know that in, in verse 16, they sought to slay him. Now in verse 18, they're really getting their feathers ruffled because Jesus says that, oh, my father work is here and do I work? Mm -hmm. So that just, now that is absolutely against Pharisaical law mm -hmm. to even s imply that God would have
got to be that low to come and love a man. Mm. You know, I mean, come on. You, you right. have now taken away all of the, the um, what's the word I want? Righteousness of God and thrown it out the window, which mm-hmm. is, isn't what Jesus did at all. Right. But that's what they're, they're looking at. They mm-hmm. say, wait a minute. No, this can't be. Because they were looking at religion and not looking at relationship. Right. So Jesus now goes, or, or actually John now goes and writes, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making him equal with God. Mm-hmm. Paul writes to us in Philippians 2, that it says that uh, who be in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Mm-hmm. Now Paul writes this about Jesus in chapter 2 verse 6 mm-hmm. of Philippians. So thought it not robbery to be equal with God because Jesus Christ is equal with God. Mm-hmm. God is equal with the Father. Right. And God the Holy Spirit is another one. That mm-hmm. The three of them, they're, they're equal. They, they all hold that same um, character and attributes and, and all of that. You know, they're all one. They, they do that. Right. And this, is where the, uh, and this is where the Pharisees really found themselves at, at a quandary. Because the fact that Jesus is making, see, up until now, they could, they could accept Jesus as a prophet or as a good teacher. Didn't have any issues with that. But once he started making these kinds of um, judgment calls about who he is, it made them have to make a decision of one of two things. Because he now has totally disqualified himself from being able to be considered a good rabbi, teacher, or prophet. The minute he starts making these accusations, so he has to be one of two things. Either he is who he says he is, or he's off his rocker. Yeah. It, it can't be any other way. I mean, the, that those are the only, uh, only two options that are left. And they refuse to accept that he could actually be who he claimed to be for whatever reason. And so that only left him with the with this aspect that he must be totally off his rock, either off his rocker or he is a willfully deceiving people. Either way, if he's willfully deceiving people, then he needs to be put to death because we need to protect the 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 religious aspect. If he's totally off his rocker, guess what? Then that was equated with being demon possessed, which means you are still of the still devil, so you deserve to get yep. killed, yep. right? And and so this is where they were at in that culture, and so they're acting. I mean, it sounds almost very rude. That well, why would they seek to do this? Well, based upon law, and you look at the Old Testament law, for one to consider themselves equal to God, that was the penalty for that. You know, and so they were acting coerced, but they forgot that you know there could be a possibility this could be true. Yeah, you know what really gets me, and we have to close with this. But what really gets me is this: is here they are, they're judging Jesus on this as being a deceitful man. Mm-hmm. But as I, you know, have studied Phariseeism and all of this kind of stuff, what is the basic number one tool of the Pharisee mm-hmm. to be deceitful. Yeah. Well, don't we find that in, in our own relationships yeah. that the very things that tick us off in somebody else, it's nine times out of ten, it's the very issue that we have ourselves yeah. Yeah. that we are wrestling with. Yeah, and I, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I know that to be so very true, mm-hmm. is my biggest problem is usually what I see in somebody else that they say, now, how come he can do that? <laughs> you know, I can't do that. But that's what the Pharisees would do. It next week we'll pick up in verse 19, mm. and I don't know if we'll get through 47, but but you know this whole conversation now that Jesus is going to give mm-hmm. um, in regards to who he is and what he is doing and the equality that he has with the Father, which to me would be a great way to go into the mm-hmm. Passion Week of who he is and why he was able to do what he did. And with the grace and the power that he did it, you mm-hmm. know, it's just, it's just amazing. I'm Pastor Harold Noyes, pastor of the Community Christian Church. We're located on the Lower Road in Athens, Vermont. We have morning worship at 9.30 on every Sunday morning. We have evening worship at 6 p.m. And then we also have Bible studies Tuesday night and Wednesday night. We have prayer meeting right there in the sanctuary. If you're in our area, we certainly would love to uh, have you stop in and say hi. Um, we are doing a sunrise service at 7 o'clock on uh, Easter morning. 
then we are having a breakfast after that and then going right into the morning worship. So if you're in our area and you want to be a part of a sunrise service right there at the church and have breakfast with us, we'd love to have you do that. And if you're in the Charlestown, New Hampshire area, we'd love to see you down at Life on Main at 223 Old Springfield Road, which is the Charlestown Senior Center. Every Sunday morning, we have coffee at 10 with a service at 11 o'clock. Uh, love to have you come on out and join us also in celebrating this incredible week. Uh, we also are going to be taking a break. As you know, we've been showing the Chosen film yep. over the last number of Friday nights, and uh, or the Chosen series. And we are going to take a break during Easter week from that. We are actually going to be showing on Friday night... Uh, on Good Friday, the uh, release of a stage performance that was called Jesus, not the Jesus film that was released about th uh, 30 years ago now, um, but this is actually done at Sight and Sound Theaters in mm. Pennsylvania, and it's done before a live audience. Uh, we're going to be showing that. It covers everything from the birth all the way through uh, Jesus going back to the Father. Uh, just a phenomenal. We had the chance to actually yeah, go watch it. I was going to say, we've been there and, together. Uh, right. So it was wonderful. But yeah, so that'll be uh, Good Friday at 7 o'clock in the evening. Love to have you come up, be a part of that. Also, uh, we are going to be hosting an Easter egg hunt uh, for the community, uh, Charlestown, or if you're in some of the close by uh, proximity somebody feel free to come on out again at the senior center on easter sunday at one o'clock in the afternoon so we certainly wish that you have a great passion week and we'll be seeing you next thursday yeah right? next thursday all right have a great day